Um, and before I waste any of your people, any of your time, uh, this is ideally suited to thin sleeper track. Um, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So let's um, make a start. So this shows the sort of track for which it's ideally suited. So thin sleeper, um, this is homemade track. It does work reasonably well with flexi track. And into shot is coming some of the thick sort of toy train stuff or Pico would be the same. Um, and this doesn't work as well. And the reason is that this method essentially puts down um, a monolayer of ballast. And with the track showing now, you'd have to go back in afterwards and top it up, which rather defeats the object of the exercise. So thin sleepered best. Um, the ash ballasting, which I'm going to show later, would work or will work with the, uh, the thicker stuff. Um, so all is not lost there. As you can see my finger pointing at things from the commentary, I'm sorry, it does seem a little bit out of sync. So track preparation, um, two things you'll notice, it's pre-wired um, and also pre-painted. And what I use uh, for the painting is precision uh, straight from the tin, so P977 rusty rails, and simply spray along the side of the rails, all four sides, um, just you know, getting a good dense coverage. For the sleeper color, I favor track dirt, um, but you could use weathered wood. It's whatever you fancy and whatever looks right to your eye. Um, it's used straight from the tin so that I get consistency of color across different batches of track. Uh, you don't want your track looking like a zebra. You'll then be saying, well, that's not very realistic, having everything looking the same. But I then go back afterwards, once everything's laid and ballasted, and gently tone things down with the airbrush, a um, bit of weathering, dark mucky spots uh, where it's needed, where loco stand, that sort of thing. And for spraying the sleepers, like I'm showing now, just spray down vertically and, and cover the sleepers that, that way. So now we have a representation of the baseboard. Um, for a track bed, I favor three millimeter closed cell foam. Some of you will like cork. And I cover the whole of the baseboard with the foam and then cut out later where the, uh, the ballast shoulders are, and I'll show a method of doing that. And that's where, cork ha uh, where foam has an advantage. Uh, the foam has been pre-primed um, with a bit of dilute PVA, and you can see a couple of holes there drilled ready to take the, the wires. Just obviously make sure that your wires are not going to sort of get in the way of anything underneath the baseboard, like a beam or a point motor. Right, to gluing. Um, these food dispensers make brilliant glue dispensers. So that's not mayonnaise, that is PVA. And you're looking for a reasonably generous and even coat of glue. And if you try this method, which I, I hope you will, um, it wouldn't harm as a one-off to do a trial piece like I'm showing you here, just to get a sense of how much glue to put on, what you need to hand, um, and how it works for you. And that will be time well spent, I think. As you can see, just spreading the glue out. Nice, even coat. And it is trial and error, really. Uh, this is neat PVA, I've not diluted it in any way. Um, and you want enough to be able to grab the track and the ballast, but not so much that it starts oozing up between the sleepers, because that will not be realistic. If you do go to the odd holiday where a bit of ballast misses, going back in with a dab of glue and a sprinkle of ballast afterwards is no great drama. So we come to lay the track, feed the wires through, and winkle them down. Now this is much easier on the layout because the baseboard doesn't move around on the layout uh, and you're not having to hold it with your, with your second hand. Just getting that into place, bedded down. You can pull down on the wires just to help bed it down as well, and then weight it. Now you've got plenty of time with this. You've got 15 to 20 minutes play time, unless you choose to try and put track down in the middle of a summer heat of 30 degrees, which I'm sure you wouldn't. Um, so plenty of time, and really that time is spent lining this piece of track up with the bit you've already laid. Uh, so get your fish plates on, get it butted into the, the last piece of track you laid, uh, sight down or use a mirror 
and make sure this piece of track flows beautifully into what's already there. No kinks, no dog legs. And if necessary, run a, run a wagon between the two, uh, you know, push a, push a wagon through um, just to make sure it flows through nice and smoothly. Just went through this bit. So I would probably let the weights sit there for about five or 10 minutes tops. Um, just allow the glue to start grabbing the track. And then we're going to come to the actual ballasting. We'll talk about ballast in more detail in a minute. And then it's just a matter of, you know, the magic occurring, you just sprinkle it on. No having to dodge it in and around the sleepers. Uh, use a pretty generous coat because you're going to retrieve most of this or recover most of this. And then you can do a final check, make sure you've not disturbed the alignment at all, maybe wait it for a minute or two, but in fact you can hoover it off pretty well straight away to be honest. Um, just going to fill in a bit of a gap there. And then we take off the excess. So I use one of these portable um, rechargeable hoovers. I keep this one just for ballast, so I know it's clean and I can recover the ballast and not worry about it being contaminated with anything else. Um, some of you may be saying, well, it's very easy just laying nine inches of track. What about real life? Well, certainly on my Wickham layout and James's Padfacoom layout, we've managed to lay uh, a meter of double track with a crossover in it uh, all in one go without too much problem. It didn't, didn't need two of us though. You couldn't do that on your own. So here we are, just literally hoovering off. You could use a domestic hoover, um, turn it to its lowest setting, put a pop sock over the nozzle, um, let a little bit of the pop sock go into the nozzle, and then you can recover the ballast from that. Now, if you use that technique, I guarantee you that you will lose concentration at some point and <laughs> the pop sock will disappear. How do I know that? Yeah. So there we go. Um, the holes the wires go down can remain a little visible, but it doesn't take much to just put a little drop of glue in there and a, and a sprinkle of ballast and job's done. No idea what I'm saying on the commentary there. So we can talk about ballast now. So we've used Woodland Scenics pretty well. Um, comes in fine, uh, three grades, fine, medium and coarse. Some people refer to that as N, double O and O, but I don't think that's helpful. Uh, we use the fine for four mil and the medium for seven mil. Um, and basically I've made up a blend um, that looks right to my eye. So this represents clean ballast. And that is three parts light gray, two parts gray, and one part buff. Again, it's just it's what's right to your eye. So this will be freshly laid ballast. And on the Wickham layout, there's a couple of main lines running through the middle of, that, that represent that. And then we look at older ballast. It's been down for a while. Um, this is seven parts gray, one and a half of light gray, one and a half of black, and one of buff. And you'll see I've written these numbers on the side of those canisters so that I can mix up future batches and get it the same. Experience has shown that with our club P4 Aylesbury layout, at adding a 10% of medium grade does, bear with me, uh, just hold that a second, um, does actually give a little bit more variation in uh, texture and, and looks a bit better. I've not done that on Wiccan because we didn't think of it then, but uh, I would do that in the future. So what we're going to do now is have a look at the ballast shoulder. And this is a method that we've evolved um, which allows you to cut the ballast shoulder after the event and it will parallel the track, whatever your track is doing, so it'll follow a curve beautifully. And there's this little uh, jig, so a sheet of plastic card, uh, two strips of 30,000 square evergreen welded on at the track gauge. Uh, that's fine for EM, goes through the point work nicely. I suspect for P4 you might, use, you might need to use 20,000, and for O gauge you could use something a bit bigger. And that's set pretty accurately to 18, 18.2 mil for me. On top of that, I've built up a platform, and you can see on one edge, 
um, I've created a chamfer. And that distance from the rail to the edge of the chamfer, chamfer has been arrived at by uh, trial and error. On this side, I've got a straight vertical uh, overlap, um, and that's designed to keep the blade vertical and to cut the right distance from the rail to the uh, platform wall, not the platform edge, the platform wall, because uh, the edge oversails a little bit. And again, if you've got a curved track, this enables you to produce the, you know, take the foam out to exactly the same curve and then put your wall in against it. So pop the jig in between in the forefoot. You see it's one of these extendable knife blades. Now I have to confess this demo at this point looks clunky. I don't know why, um, but the blade wasn't sharp, although I thought I used a new blade. Um, but you can see the principle of using the jig to let the knife come down at the right angle and cut right through the ballast shoulder down to the baseboard. On the layout, for some reason this worked a lot better, so I'm not quite sure what's gone on here. But we've had to have several goes at getting it to cut right through. But you see the principle. And again on the layout, I found the foam just peeled off nicely. And this to my mind is the advantage of foam over cork in that getting cork up in this way would be much more difficult. Not impossible, but certainly not easy. So up it comes. So the advantage of putting foam all over the board is you haven't got to be exact to where you, where you think your track bed's gonna be. Um, you've got a pretty good idea, obviously. Um, but this method does make sure the ballast shoulder follows the line of the track perfectly. As I say, not the most elegant part of the demonstration, my apologies. A little bit of a tidy up and a trim there. But you'll see the general effect shortly. Quick rub down with some sandpaper. good to go. So next we're going to do the ash cess and this is a technique uh, that was first described to my knowledge by Gordon Gravitt and we're using Humbrol number no. five gloss dark admiralty grey. Now that might seem counterintuitive to be using gloss um, but the reason is it stays sticky longer than matte wood and this is what's going to grab the ash and once the ash is down the gloss effect is entirely lost. So what we're doing is putting down a reasonably generous um, coating of the grey. You don't have to be too accurate if you come up a little bit onto the shoulder it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to go back and do the shoulder after this. Um, plus the fact that balanced shoulders were never that crisp they're always a little bit of stuff spilled over. Just to say, once um, we've done this live demo, the original um, film with its commentary will go up on the on the wiki website. Uh, so you can either go and look at it again, should you wish, or if you think there are friends who would be interested, you can point them in that direction. There we go, just the last touch. And then I'm going to use real fire ash. So this is a mixture of wood and coal. I'll go into that in a bit more detail when we talk about ash ballasting. And then just sprinkling that on with a tea strainer. The ash has already been sieved. This is, I'm just using the tea strainer as a means of um, sprinkling really. And the paint grabs it pretty quickly, as you'll see in a sec. Just doing a Tommy Cooper impression there. And again. Now, um, 
I would obviously on the layout, I can't tap it off, so I would hoover it off. And there's not an awful lot of point um, trying to recover it because the ash is just too fine. So that goes straight into the hoover, really. But there's a close up, and I hope you'll agree that looks pretty realistic. You've got texture, you've got color variation, um, and I hope it looks like the real thing. So we're now just going to finish this bit off by touching in the ballast shoulder. A little bit of thin, slightly thin PVA. This, this particular PVA has got a bit of uh, black powder paint added. It's just handy because we're going to use that later in the ash ballasting demo. So again, you don't have to be super accurate here. You just want to get the, the sides covered with some glue, reasonably generous coating. And then sprinkle on some more ballast. Again, be generous. You're going to recover most of this. Again, this will show how quickly the the glue or the paint grabs the uh, grabs the ballast. There we go. And what I'm showing now is if you get a little bit of a humping effect on the top of the uh, the shoulder, then just, you know, at this point, just dab it down with your fingers, very straightforward. Okay, so there we have one piece of track. You can see that was a bit of um, flexi track um, where the webs between the rails aren't always perfectly covered. And I think the way around that, uh, sorry, the webs between the sleepers, uh, is just to be a bit more generous with the glue so it flows over those webs and takes the ballast with it. Okay, ash ballasting. Um, another piece of baseboard. We've tried various methods uh, on the Club Oakhampton layout. We used um, leveling compound, thinking that would be a good idea. And what you're aiming to do is get the, the ballast right up to sleeper level, as you'd see in yards or even over sleepers, as you might see in, in loco yards and, and also sidings and light branch lines, Colonel Stevens, that sort of thing. So trying to get uh, the ballast level up to the sleepers. With the leveling compound, it was tedious. You had to uh, create little walls around the track to stop stuff running all over the place. Um, and even then, you still had to then go back afterwards, paint between the sleepers and, and, and add the ballast. So we've evolved this method, which meets the brief of laying and ballasting in one hit. So what we're using here is tile adhesive. Um, this is powdered tile adhesive made up into a paste. You'll notice that we're using best domestic cutlery to lay this. I do have the permission of the domestic authorities. As I do most of the cooking, I am the domestic authorities. Thickness wise, thicker than toothpaste, um, but not too stiff. Again, it's, this is trial and error. I mean, I, I can't really sort of, you, you, you've got to try it for yourself again on a test piece. You want it thick enough um, not to run all over the place, uh, but not too thick because if it is, it will go off too quickly. Just dropped a bit on my trousers, I think. There we go. Um, and if it's too thick, it'll ooze up between the sleepers and look like a hovis loaf, which is not the effect you're looking for. So the level, the, the, uh, the thickness I'm looking for here is between three quarters and a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter and a millimeter. That's an old meat carving knife. The other thing you could use would be a, a cake icing pallet knife, which is nice and flexible as well. And the next key bit is to then put a layer um, of PVA on top. So this is the dilute PVA we used before with a bit of powder paint in it, black powder paint. This is important and is, it, is there because um, the tile adhesive on its own will not grab the ballast. It's not sticky enough very good at grabbing the track and once it's gone rock hard it's it's bulletproof almost um, but it's not uh, sticky enough to grab the ballast so we found that by putting a thin layer of sort of slurry of PVA on top that solves the problem to do that we're then going to find our holes again just poke the wire up from underneath a piece of wire will do and then we're going to have a fumble while we try and get the track in place. Again, easier on the layout because you're not trying to hold the layout with your second hand or it stays still. This is where with your third hand. Oh, there's the third hand, jolly good. 
and my trusty assistant, James. Now, with, with the ash ballasting, you've got to be a bit more lively and off the mark um, because the um, tile adhesive will go off quicker than the PVA. So um, you've got to be a bit more on the ball, particularly when it comes to lining up the track with previous um, laid track. You can shuffle it around a bit. If you've got the consistency of the tile adhesive just right, uh, it'll allow you to move it and it won't sort of hump up in front of where you're moving it or leave a, leave a void behind where you've moved it from, if you see what I mean. So ash, as mentioned earlier, as is real fire ash, so a mixture of coal and wood. Um, I put it in a pestle and mortar and ground it up a bit and then sieved it. And there are plenty of fine mesh domestic sieves available from the likes of Wilco and so on. But if you go on one of the techniques and demos, there's an article by our chairman, Paul, on ballast. Um, and he found some stacking sort of scientific sieves in different grades available. And the, the link is where to get them is in there. So it's four trays, you stack them up, you put the ballast in at the top, put the lid on, give it a damn good shake. And at the bottom, you've got virtually dust and then gradually coarser and coarser ballast as you come up through the tins. So for four, the dust would be great for two mil, the middle two tins probably would be great for four mil and then the top tin ideal for seven. And then just a question of taking off the excess. I'm going to hoover some of this off in a minute. And then just gently blow off any other excess. And just a word of warning, at this point, it will look dreadful. Um, and for the next three to four or five hours, it might even look worse. Um, it, it just does. Once it's dried out, Hang on, let's just pause that a second. Once it's dried out, it looks fine. And we just now move down to the layout uh, and we're just going to look at some of the mainline ballasting and some of the ash ballasting on, on Wickham. Um, so as you can see, nice sweeping S-curves through the station, uh, the ballast shoulder following the, the, the track nicely. Uh, all this track is hand-built um, using exact scale chairs on plastic sleepers and steel rail. Um, we're just going to scan across um, and in a minute we'll zoom in on a bit of ballasted track. Some of this track has been weathered, still needs a little bit of weathering on some of the point ends where we've got bare solder still. Sorry that's a bit out of focus but you get the general idea. And a mixture there of fresh ballast and, and old ballast. And the line is the four, in the foreground is the one leading off to the goods yard. And you can see the transition from mainline ballast through into pure ash ballast. And as you can see, once it is dried off, uh, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, a little bit more work to do on this. It needs a little bit of touching in in places and it also needs a bit of greenery and weeds and, and so on. And there we go. So let me stop sharing. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is trackling and ballasting. I commend it as very time saving. Um, you get a good effect, I think. Uh, one of the things people, or one reason for not doing it uh, is people say, well, I'd like to get my track down, test it, make sure it all works OK, which is fine. Um, in terms of how I've done it, I, you know, plane track, I don't you know, do you really need to test that? You shouldn't have any electrical problems. And if you built it well and you know a wagon runs through it, it should be fine. With point work, I do electrically test it before I lay it. So I make sure the crossing V is electrically isolated properly from the rest of the track, that the closure rails and point blades are bonded to the stock rails. And I run a long wheelbase, um, four wheel, 21 ton mineral through under gravity and also an eight wheel Buckman um, four millimeter tender through as well. And that seems to work. So all that track was laid without any other testing than that. Um, and apart from minor fettling and tweaking, which James and I have been doing over the last three months, um, it's gone down without any problems. So we haven't had any major snurglies. I haven't had to take any track up at all um, to because of, of errors. If you do need to take track up, um, and we have done on one or two layouts, 
you can get that bread knife or that, that meat knife under the track fairly easily. It's only a single layer of ballast and it will come up pretty well. But again, I am not to do that. So that's it. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. Uh, very interesting. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, um, then uh, since our numbers are reasonable, please unmute yourself and uh, you're welcome to ask Tim a question. Um, I have one straight away um, that I haven't asked it before. <laughs> you uh -oh. mean, <laughs> um, you're using a grey gloss paint when you're doing the shoulder. Is there any particular reason for that or could it be any other colour? No, I'm, again, I've just gone on. If you get um, Gordon Gravitt's book on, on uh, scenery and so on, he did a whole lot of experiments with different colours of paint, including black, light grey and various other things. And that seemed to be the you know the color density behind the, the, the ash that worked best so i've gone literally you know i've not reinvented the wheel i've just pinched his idea mm -hmm. so i think on um, oakhampton we use quite a lot of black gloss for yeah. underneath and that's mainly because what we had to hand probably yeah definitely work better with the gloss though that's uh, no doubt about that at all uh, look i'm referring to bear with me um is that one. I'm not sure whether that's the right way around for you lot, but that's volume three. Uh, and that gives you, you good ideas of doing roadways, paths, ash ballasting and so on. Well worth, well worth purchasing. Yep. And the ash itself is something that you've got from your own personal fire. Yeah, the, the, own, the own family fire, yeah, that's right. Has anybody ever tried using any of the commercial products? Uh, I don't know if Grindley Brook have um, done that. Um, Peter, you got any comment? You're muted, by the way. Uh, yeah, we tried lots of different commercial products for the ballast. Um, for the ash, uh, as Brian explained during our presentation, uh, he used a lot of uh, cinders that were in the towpath running close to where we, our clubhouse is, and that they were all sieved through to get to the right uh, size. Um, do you want to add something? Yeah, it's um, like it, we managed to, um, we spent a lot of time sieving stuff um, on club nights to get the smaller size um, stuff. And then somebody came up with the, um, the fact that Ikea do this, this black sand. And so we added that. And I think there was something else we added, but for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. Now, I think it was Woodland Scenics, they do a fine cinders. So in the end, I think we used a combination of all three together to get the cinders. The ballast was um, something we bought from CNL years ago. And the problem we had is we almost used it up and it got mislaid in the storeroom somewhere. And we had to touch up some places, but we could not find the exact color um, to touch it up. And that created no end of problems. We eventually found that the, uh, the box where it was in, we got a little bit left. And so we're guarding that meticulously so nobody nicks it so that we can maybe we need to touch up, we can match the colour because some of them you put it on and then you add PVA and it kind of the ballast turns a shade of green. And that was a bit unfortunate. I think that's the real granite does that. Um, and of course Woodland Scenics is is it cocoa shell? I can't quite remember. Um, but I think you, using one product is a good idea so you don't run into that trouble and as I said with mine I, I kept a note of the blend so that I you know I could uh, repeat that with future batches. Mm -hmm. um, I was just looking on the wiki, uh, the show wiki, uh, the guide to the sieves that Paul our chairman used uh, is under techniques and demos, it's then under building your layout and the cost of a stack of four from Rapid Electronics and they are sieve sizes of 0.5, 0.25, 0.125, and 0.063 uh, was 20 quid plus VAT. Uh, sorry, yeah, 20 quid plus delivery and VAT. So 22, 24, probably about 30 quid, I should think. I think we also found quite often the commercial products, we were obviously looking for O-gauge stuff. We found the O-gauge products were usually, we, f we felt were too large. Yes. So we often ended up buying products that were supposed to be for four mil. Well, that's what I said in my, uh, I was saying, we, I was using what some people call two mil ballast and the four mil stuff is what we use for the, uh, for the seven mil side. I don't think using scale is helpful. It's fine, medium and coarse. Hmm. 
which is what, what, what Woodland, Scenic, Woodland Scenics call it. You've only got to measure the ballast on a, on a real railway to realise that the average stone size is around two and a half, maybe, you know, two and a half inches. Um, and that, you know, what that scales down to, um, absolutely right. The, uh, what's advertised as O gauge is just way too big, you know. It's equivalent to about six inch lump of stone, which you certainly wouldn't get on a, on a real railway. Going back to your point about um, colour, uh, Brian, um, if you look at the ballasting on a real railway, you will find completely different colouring. Um, oh, yeah. Ballast has been replaced in a section. Yeah, it, it just jarred with me, that was all. I think that the green, if the green aspect of it just jarred when you added the PVA. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, if you go to Scotland, it, the ballast is red, isn't it? It's, um, I remember being at Perth Station, I couldn't believe the ballast was, was red. And on the uh, Southern Railway, Meldon ballast, um, which is granite ballast, has, has quite a lot of iron ore in it. Yeah. So you've got the rust colour. Yeah. But even if you do get colour variations, so the transition from one to the other is, is not usually that abrupt, unless it really is a, a, a load of freshly laid ballast. So I think you've got to be a bit careful. You, you know, you don't want the zebra effect. <laughs> certainly see photos of the real thing where that is the case, where you do have an abrupt change. The problem is that it... You know, it might be real, but on a model, it doesn't look right. <laughs> yeah, it's one. It just looks just that sticks out. You don't want something on a model. You don't want something that sticks out too much, do you? That's the, no. no, it's just it just it's strange, isn't it? That sometimes you can't model things that are you know in in reality. It's yeah. like um, you know the side of a t uh, a typical side of a tender is tends to be dished in panels. But you do that in a model, it looks dreadful. Mm. <laughs> well, for the purest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a tank engine that looks like that, we're tempted to uh, paint it up. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Tim on the uh, track laying side of things? Okay. Tim, mm. um, I remember visiting your layout some years ago, and if I remember correctly, the scenic part for the station area is in in one shed, isn't it? But don't, don't you have lines that leave the shed and go around the garden a bit and then come back in the other end of the shed? Y yes and no. I I used to have the return curves only outside the shed, thinking that would be a good idea to sort of keep most of the scenic stuff in the shed and not waste space on return curves. Uh, it never proved very reliable. Uh, so trying to get them weather tight but still accessible. Um, and if something stalled out there, you know, it's a real pain in the ass to go outside and poke it uh, and so on and so forth. So about ooh, how long ago, James, three or four years ago, five years ago, maybe um, I put another two meters on the shed. Um, fortunately, managed to find the same shed builder in business. So he, he made me another couple of segments that matched perfectly. And three or four of us sort of took the end off the shed bunged another two meters on put the end back on again um, and then shuffle the whole layout along so now the whole thing if you look at the video uh, which is up uploaded um, the whole thing is now uh, inside accessible it also gave me the advantage of being able to uh, create a lifting flap um, so as we've got older uh, it's now easier to get in and out of the shed um, and in fact only the other day we've finally sorted out a method of making sure that flap perfectly aligns uh, each time we put it down so yeah, so it's coming along, and much more scenery now. So there is there is a video uh, up on the on the show. Yeah, you, you can have a look. I noticed that. Uh, Ian has my question. Up. I was going to ask how the outside track weathered, but <laughs> clearly there isn't any outside track now. Um, we have uh, uh, Ian has his hand up. Uh, th thank, thank you. Uh, th thanks, Tim, for a very very interesting presentation. Um, okay. uh, there are a whole variety of, of different brands and grades of, of PVA. So, so what, what, what type of PVA do you, do you use for, for track laying? The cheapest I can find. Um, so I use Screwfix. Um, no nonsense PVA, straight out of the bottle. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. good. I, I have now made the um, Tim's full video where, where he commentates on this method that is now on the um, the Railex uh, virtual show website and um, that website will be running for the next month so you have plenty of time to catch up and have a look at it again so that is now live.
thank you all for watching. Thank you very much for running the show team. Oh, it's a big team effort, big team effort, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. It's very kind of you. Okay. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the show and uh, goodbye to everybody. Cheers. Thanks, James. Oh, yeah.